Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm your host, Steve Barnes. In this episode, we'll have a conversation with Rory Babich, President and CEO of the Florida Panthers National Hockey League franchise. He'll give us an inside look at what it means to lead a professional sports organization, and he'll be talking with us about what's in store for the Florida Panthers and their fans this year. Thanks again for joining us, Rory. It's uh, wonderful to have you here uh, on the program. So let's just start things off by asking you, how are the Panthers doing this, this, at this early part of the season? Well, thanks first of all for uh, inviting me to speak with you today. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, Panthers uh, are off to a decent start. We started off the season playing really well. Then we hit a little bit of a rough stretch on the West Coast trip. But we rebounded with a win the other night. And we feel really good about the way the team's positioned. The way the team's uh, playing, we need a little bit more consistency, but we're, we're happy with the effort and uh, feel optimistic about the season. Uh, since we hosted him here for at least a season or two, it seems like signing Yarmir Yager was a pretty good idea. He's been an <laughs> unbelievable addition to the team. He is truly not, not just a great hockey talent, but uh, a rare and unique talent at that. He is uh, in unbelievable shape, and he is the hardest worker on the team. And, and one can really see how he just changed the whole nature of the team. When we acquired him at the trade deadline last year, obviously we signed him right after the season. And he just elevates everyone's play. He brings confidence to the other players. He leads by example. And he's done a tremendous job. We have a lot of young players on the team. And he's an important influence on those young players. And he, he really relishes that role. So he, he's been a great addition. Fantastic. So. Um People talk a lot about the front office in professional sports, major league sports. So could you talk a little bit, please, about how you as president and CEO, the ownership, and the general manager of the team interact? What are your respective roles, and how do you work together to try to, to build a successful franchise? Sure, and, and no two organizations are, are really the same in that respect, and, and culture is, as is often the case, set at the very top. Uh, so when new ownership purchased a team in September 2013, one of their mandates was, we're one organization. We don't separate out hockey on one end, business on the other, and, and never the two shall meet. Uh, so, so we treat ourselves as one organization. And I partner very closely with our general manager, Dale Talon, who uh, is one of the top, if not the top GM in the game. He helped build the Chicago Blackhawks uh, before joining the Panthers, and he's doing a tremendous job putting together uh, the Florida Panthers team. So I partner very closely with Dale on the hockey side. Dale partners with me on the business side, provides a lot of input, share a lot of ideas on marketing and ticket sales and different things we can do to help grow the sport of hockey and, and help grow the team in Florida. And that all comes from the owner. Uh, that, that's uh, the owner mandates that. We speak on a regular basis with the owner. Obviously, it could be on different things, but uh, Vinny Viola and his business partner, Doug Sifu, are owners. And Doug will be on the phone with Dale uh, virtually every day, and uh, he regularly interacts, and myself, and we have a, an executive chairman, Peter Luco, who we recently hired uh, from Philadelphia Flyers, is where he was at for a number of years. He's been a tremendous addition. Peter speaks with Doug and Vinny on a regular basis. So we all work very closely together and treat it as one organization. That's great. So, um, and just to flesh that out a little bit, so you know, during the hockey season, you show up for work in the morning. What is your day like? What, what's, what are some of the things you might be dealing with, the people you'll be interacting with, in a, in a, to the extent that there is one, a typical day sure. with the Panthers? And, and really, hockey is, uh, on the business side, uh, a 12-month-a-year job. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the work is done in the off-season with season ticket sales, coming up with marketing plans and all those programs. Once the season starts, Obviously, we're very busy with, with uh, a number of different things relating to games, and we're also responsible for booking concerts and events for the arena, so we're very busy with that as well. But uh, over the course of any particular day, it's working closely with the marketing people, working closely with the sales people, working closely with communications, arena operations. Uh, and, and the important thing is that everyone's on the same page. We worked very hard at breaking down silos. Uh, a good example is when I first started and we acquired Roberto Luongo and I was talking to different groups and every group was planning their messaging around it and I realized it wasn't a consistent theme. And I said this is why it's important that we need to have the groups interacting with one another and really deliver consistent messages. So it's really interacting with all parts of the business including HR, legal, uh, etc. Uh, because it is one organization and we need to be running on a consistent message. So that dovetails pretty nicely with my next question, which is, what is your leadership style? Uh, I imagine it must uh, be a very unique experience uh, leading uh, a professional sports franchise. So what do you emphasize? And, 
especially dealing with sports, how, what emphasis do you put particularly on something like, say, morale? Right. And it's, I, I don't adapt my leadership style by the industry in which I've been involved. I've been fortunate in my career to be involved in, in different roles, different industries. Um, but I tend not to adapt my leadership style to the industry mm -hmm. as much as trying to remain true to myself. If, if I try and act a different way, it's going to come across as phony. So I apply the same principles from a leadership perspective in whatever I do. And ironically, it's all based on a sports theme, which is a, a, a very cooperative team approach on things. So it happens to be imperfectly now that I am in the sports world and the same things that uh, we preach to our players, we preach to the entire organization. Um, but communication, cooperation, and a team effort is what uh, we really push for. Mm -hmm. and, and my style is, um, when I'm working with junior people, try and, and mentor and uh, really encourage people to throw out ideas, communicate, uh, and ask a lot of questions. Uh, with the senior people, it's obviously giving them uh, free reign to do their jobs and, and not micromanage. In the first year, not surprisingly, and, uh, when I stepped into my role, a lot of it was uh, very tightly run as we were resetting the business, and it was very hands-on, but it's always a balancing act. And it's the same way with the team on the ice, right? The player, the coach needs to set his system in place, but you also need to give the players a freedom mm. to be creative and do their thing that's made them successful to get to the NHL. Fantastic. So, and then just backing up a little bit, could you talk a little bit, please, about your journey? Um, you're, uh, you're a very well-known and successful lawyer, and now suddenly here you are in this studio and you're President and CEO of the Florida Panthers. Talk a little bit about how you got to where you are today, please. Sure. And uh, obviously not a, a common career track, um, the track that I've taken. That being said, there's a number of lawyers, though, that step into leadership roles in a, in a number of different industries. Um, so so uh, a law degree and working as a lawyer actually is, is one of the paths to becoming a business leader as well. Uh, in my particular situation, uh, I didn't set out to be uh, president and CEO of an NHL team. If you would have asked me five years ago if, if I could name a dream job, what would it be? Forget whether or not you're on that track or anything. I would have said I'd love to run an NHL team. So uh, ironically, it, it's, it's worked out very well. Um, but the path that got here really was not set with this as the end game as much as I, I focused on my experience and skill set mm -hmm. all along the way. And I never knew where it was going to lead, but whatever job I had, I always focused on learning as much as I could, uh, really going beyond the narrow mm -hmm. uh, assignments that I were given and making sure I understood the context, the, the business objective, and it was asking a lot of questions and, and doing a lot on, on my own and making sure I understood the business. And so basically what happened is after being involved in different roles and different businesses and my position evolved from being an outside lawyer to moving in-house, becoming a general counsel, and then moving over to a business position where I was COO, uh, responsible for running the day-to-day -day operations of, of a business. Uh, so those skill sets all the way just kept evolving. And then right place at right time, I was doing consulting, the owners of the team uh, at the time, we're looking to buy the team. They asked me, they knew I was interested in hockey. They knew I had in, uh, experience in some turnaround situations. Mm -hmm. Asked me to consult uh, with them on their acquisition, not with the intention of joining. It was really helping them yeah. with their acquisition, but it is often the case in life, one thing led to another. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to join as their special advisor, which I did, and then our CEO at the time left for a great opportunity mm -hmm. with, uh, with another company. And uh, they decided at that time, they wanted someone from outside the sports world. They wanted someone to apply different thinking, someone who had seen different industries, someone who had been in, in turnaround situations. Uh, so again, it was the right time at the right place. And now we've added a lot to our management team. We've brought in very experienced sports and entertainment people, and uh, we've built a really solid management team now. But let's back up a little bit further. Yeah. Were you a fan of hockey growing up? Yes, I, I actually loved all sports. Uh, hockey was one sport, though, that I did not play. Mm -hmm. I played all other sports growing up, but where I grew up in Central Jersey, uh, my friends and I, none of us played hockey. It wasn't something that was uh, commonly played then, but o grew up as a, a Rangers fan and always followed the sport. Uh, and then as an adult, I really became addicted to the sport. And that's a sport where I, I became a season ticket holder, had season tickets with the Rangers for 20 years and followed the sport very, very closely. Fantastic. So 
What are some of the unique challenges of being uh, a CEO, particularly, again, dealing with the ownership on, on the one hand, and you know, your management, right? right? And then the employees. What, what kind of balancing act is, like, sure. is that like? And, and there's actually, in the sports world, there, there's a third category, as is often the case in, in every industry, where uh, as a CEO, one needs to step back and, and really determine who are the stakeholders. Sure. One has to keep employees mm -hmm. happy uh, and, and motivated mm -hmm. uh, is an important part. One has to be responsive and communicative to ownership. In other situations, maybe it's a board of directors, there's public shareholders. So, so there's always a bunch of different stakeholders. The additional element in the sports world is the community and the fans. Right. And that adds a whole new element to running a, a sports team uh, because at the end of the day, we're nothing without our fans. Right. Uh, and those fans support the team and, and are loyal to the jersey, regardless of who ownership is, regardless of who management is, uh, they're, they're loyal to the jersey and we have a responsibility to those fans. So that, that adds another element to it. Um, but that's why it's important as CEO of the sports team. It's really one of the first things I did having not run a sports team and having not grown up in the sports world is really just step back, asked a lot of questions, made sure I understood what was going on, asked for a lot of data, applied things that I learned from different industries in studying this business, and then tried to take and figure out and tailor a strategy specific for this business in this location. Great, and what have community relations been like particularly? I mean, what have been some of the successes you felt the, the franchise has accomplished and maybe some of the challenges? Sure, and, and the team has been around now for a little bit more than 20 years. In its early years, it enjoyed a lot of success on the ice. Uh, made it to the Stanley Cup Finals, and the arena was sold out every night. So we know that hockey can work in South Florida. After those early years, however, and, and now the team relocates in a great arena that was built in the late 90s in Broward County uh, in Sunrise, Florida, and it's, it's, to me it's one of the top arenas in the league, but the team has not enjoyed much success on the ice in the last 15 or so years. And so what's happened is because of that lack of success, the, the fans just have not really gotten behind the team for understandable reasons. It doesn't matter whether it's in South Florida or in Chicago, Boston, when those teams hit some lean years, it's hard to keep the fan base when the team's not enjoying success on the ice. Uh, and so we've spent a lot of time, and, and obviously with the owner's encouragement, um, their money, signing a number of free agents, making some key trades, getting Roberto Luongo, getting Aramir Yager, uh, so we've made a number of key trades and those free agents to improve our team. It all starts with improving the product. Uh, and we also focus on the character of the players. So one of the things I like to say is that we have a very likable team. We have a great group of guys. Um, they're very community focused and they're very team focused. And when one goes to the arena and, and as a sports fan, as a, obviously I was a sports fan long before I was involved, as a fan and you're watching your team, you know when the guys are giving their effort. Right? You're making your choice, you're spending your money, you're making a decision where to spend your time. And when you go to the arena or the stadium or the ballpark, wherever you're at, you want to be rewarded with effort. Right. And, and you can tell when the players aren't giving their effort. And our guys give it a, their all every single night. So it's a very likable team and an easy team to get behind. Uh, so that's a big part of it. But then it's also reaching out to the community, whether it's th through youth hockey, trying to introduce more kids to the game, whether it's appealing to parents. Now, South Florida has a number of people who are transplanted from the Midwest, from the North, from Canada. Uh, Europeans, so there's a number of people really who are familiar with hockey, and they may have their hometown teams, but with a strong team and, and with having a team that people can identify with, you know, we'll get them as the Panthers their second favorite team, and when their team comes in, they'll root for their team, but every other night, they'll be rooting for the Panthers. But it really is establishing that brand and that connection, and that, that's one of the things about sports. Uh, people who love sports are very passionate about their teams, and they want to be proud of their teams. And you measure pride in different ways. That includes by giving that effort every night on the ice, but it's also what does the team mean for the community? What does the team do to the community? How does the team give back to the community? So that, that's one of the things I talked about with the fans and the community. People have to be proud of their team. And it's not, I often say, it's not just being in the community, but being part of the community. And that's a lot of what we're focused on. I do want to touch upon the branding and the, and the giving back to the community in just a moment. But if you could please, given the fact that all the best coaches are in the stands, particularly people like me, how do you and uh, the ownership, the GM, uh, what are the deliberations and machinations that go into trying to put together a winning team, a playoff level team? Right. And, and it's interesting uh, on the inside because, uh, like you said, I was 
uh, coach and, and GM many nights as I sat in the stands uh, watching uh, watching the team and uh, obviously uh, critical when the team was losing and and uh, always thinking and that's one of the beauties of sports is everyone's an expert in it uh, which is one of the things that makes it fun and one of the things that makes people passionate about it I'm um, being on the inside it's very interesting uh, seeing what goes in to making a team and, and seeing all the challenges. I mean, if you, if you look at building through a draft, which is a common way in the NHL, you're scouting kids 16, 17 years old and not just looking at how they're projected to develop physically, but really how they're projected to develop mentally. And it's really trying, you spend time with them, you may interview them as part of the draft process and really trying to understand how they're going to develop. There's a whole bunch of people with a world of talent who may not have the drive or ambition to, to maximize that talent. There's others whose talent may be a little bit lacking at that point, but they haven't matured fully yet. And, and you see things in them that are really going to uh, help make them successful pro athletes. So we have a large scouting staff at the amateur level, scout throughout North America and scout throughout Europe. Uh, and the key part is, and that's driven by the GM, what type of team do we want to put together? Is it a fast team? Is it a big team? Is it a combination? What types of players are we looking for? As we build the team, where are their holes? And not just where is there a hole this year, as we look at our roster, where do we see gaps in two, three years? Because really building through the draft is how one builds a core for the team. As one builds through the draft, then that's where you supplement with free agents and trades. And in many cases, you're bringing in guys who add that missing piece, who add a part of the game that is missing from the current roster. But also importantly, since we do have a bunch of young guys as do uh, teams building through the draft, people who can serve as good mentors and serve as role models for the players. Um, particularly with a young team, it only takes one or two rotten eggs to, to spoil a locker room. On a team full of veterans, if there's one player who doesn't have a good attitude, it's easy for the other veterans to get him in line. On a young team, one really needs to be careful with the character of the players. So it really is a combination. We also have pro scouts that are observing all the teams. Uh, our general manager speaks with the scouts on a regular basis. At the start of the season, we'll talk about what we're looking for, and then there'll be periodic meetings throughout the year. And obviously, as the draft approaches, more and more detailed meetings getting ready for the draft. And to what extent does the salary cap impact those deliberations and uh, machinations and so forth, especially this year in the NFL, part of the, the griping, if you will, is that for all, you know, all the benefits of the salary cap there, it doesn't seem to be much parity as certain teams go on unbeaten, at least at this part of the season. Right, right. Now, and the salary cap in the NHL uh, has played a very important role in, in enabling teams to be competitive because it's a hard cap. One can't exceed it and then pay a luxury tax. And so what it really does uh, is put teams on a more equal footing. And teams have to take into account. We've seen teams that have been wildly successful in the past that run into salary cap issues, can't resign their players. Uh, that gives other opportunities more of a chance to acquire some of those players. And so in, in this day and age, it's, not, it, it's a great question because it's not just evaluating talent, but it's also how to manage the salary cap. And it's not just the salary cap for this year, but as we sign guys to longer term contracts, we may have guys, especially with the young team, coming off their entry level contracts that we're going to have to resign one, two, three years down the road. And we need to make sure that we don't take on too much, lock in too much salary right now. That's going to affect our maneuverability mm -hmm. several years down the road. And under the most recent collective bargaining agreement, that lasts, well, now it's eight more years. Is that correct? I believe that's right. Yeah. Great. So uh, let's talk a little bit, too, now about uh, some of the new rules uh, this year for the NHL, especially three, three on three overtime, which um, I think is just fantastic. But I'm curious just what folks inside the building think right. of that rule. Yeah, and, and the NHL has been experimenting over the years. It, as, as you know, it used to be uh, games would end in a tie. Uh, after um, recently this century, they, they put in place the uh, four on four overtime and then the shootout. Right. And uh, a lot of fans were critical, uh, or players were critical of the shootouts, and that's no way to end a team game. Um, but if you've been at a game and watch a shootout, every single person in the arena is on his or her feet yeah. watching it. It actually is quite exciting. And obviously, they didn't do that in the playoffs, where games are played uh, to a finish. 
Uh, however, what was happening is a number of games started going to the shootout. So the league and the rules committee looked at it and this year decided to move to three on three overtime uh, to reduce the number of games that go to a shootout. So it's really decided in a team competition. And the energy on a three on three is just tremendous. It's nonstop action. Right. And it's, a lot of breakaways. A lot, a lot of breakaways. <laughs> and that's it. You could go down on a breakaway and if you miss that net wide, comes off the boards, then the other There's team's coming back on a, on a breakaway. <laughs> so it really adds a lot of excitement. And that's great. So um, yeah, let's now let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you're doing as part of the community outreach. Mm -hmm. um, what particularly do you find excited about some of the marketing or outreach efforts you're involved in? Sure. And, and like any business, uh, as I said, the owners bought it back in September 2013. So uh, it, it's never a, an overnight plan and, and all these things are a process. Mm -hmm. Uh, that take place uh, over time. Last year we were really resetting the business, doing a lot of different things with marketing, uh, with our, our corporate partners and with our fans. This year now we've really ramped everything up and as I mentioned we've brought in some tremendous talent um, starting with our executive chairman Peter Luco um, who's been incredibly successful and, and helps uh, really helps the franchise tremendously. Uh, we've brought in some new marketing people, we've increased our marketing budget tremendously and so we've really been trying a lot of different initiatives. Last year, for example, it was just a toehold, but we wanted to reach out and we started broadcasting our games in Spanish language. Mm -hmm. And we were doing one game a month. It was like, let's test the waters, let, let's start a reach out. And that's in and of itself not a strategy right. for reaching out to the Hispanic market, but it does show that we're thinking about it. It does show that we want to do it and it was a good way to get introduced mm -hmm. to the market. This year now we're broadcasting all of our home games right. in the Spanish language. It's simulcast on, on Fox Sports Florida in, in Spanish as well. Uh, then there's another uh, a number of other community outreaches, whether it's on the charitable side with our foundation or from a marketing side. So um, there's been, and we focus on, we're located in Broward County, um, but we're also convenient for Palm Beach County and for Miami-Dade County. Mm -hmm. So our, our marketing program actually runs through all three counties. And this year, again, as part of a, a broader outreach and increasing uh, the brand name and brand recognition. Uh, even on radio now, we broadcast all the way down to the Florida Keys as well. Oh, great. And um, just to step back a second, you're, you're talking about management and leadership and, and marketing and outreach. Uh, full and fair disclosure, you are a graduate of Penn Law, uh, but how and to what extent does being a lawyer help you in your, in your job as CEO? Yes, it's uh, being a lawyer, uh, going to Penn Law opened up uh, an incredible number of doors for me, uh, n no doubt about it. And, I can honestly sit here and say I would not be where I am today if not mm -hmm. for going to Penn Law. All the decisions we make and everything we do, you know, lead down different paths. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that really all started with my attending Penn Law. Uh, and I think the, the single biggest value is law school teaches one a certain way to think. Mm -hmm. um, it's very analytical. It's focused on the details. Uh, now as CEO, one may say, well, why do you have to focus on details? It's, it's a big picture strategy. But in order to get to big picture strategy, I'm a firm believer that that's, you get to the point where you can focus on big picture strategy because you understand the details. Mm -hmm. And then you have other people who you work with and they then start to focus on the details and you, take, uh, and you have confidence in them. Mm -hmm. That enables one to focus on the big picture. Uh, so I think it's really the, the training on the thought process that really is what led to opening up all these doors. And it, it's the way I, learn to look at issues, look at problems, and how I applied that in my everyday professional life. You mentioned the foundation. Could you talk a little bit about some of the efforts uh, about which you're particularly um, pleased or proud? Sure, and so we have the Florida Panthers Foundation, and uh, that's uh, something that we're really starting to ramp up. Uh, last year we did some things with it, but uh, we were actually uh, just starting to formalize our plans, and, and through our ownership, uh, contributed a lot to a number of different causes. We tend to focus on the military. Our owner is a proud West Point graduate. Uh, and uh, so we do a lot of things military related. We have a number of employees, uh, West Point graduates and, and other veterans who work in our organization. So there, there are certain parts of our, our foundation that do focus on different initiatives around veterans. We also are very big uh, on focusing on children, uh, education. Uh, we do things with the Ocean Exploration Trust and uh, Dr. Ballard and his uh, research vessel, the Nautilus, uh, that we bring down to Broward County and, and there's certain uh, STEM education in the school systems that we work with as well. 
uh, the Boys and Girls Club. So there's a number of different initiatives focused on children and ed education, and, and we're proud of that. What advice do you have for uh, students or others seeking to work in sports management at a high level? Right. And, and as, as is clear from my background, I did not take the traditional route uh, to sports management. Uh, ha however, even early in my career and dating back to when I was uh, just starting in law school and thinking of trying to become a sports agent, and I remember meeting with someone then and, and discussing how does one become a sports agent. And, and the advice I received, and it's something that I, I followed uh, to this day, um, the advice I received was basically there's very few opportunities for sports agents and even fewer for uh, people that don't have any experience as a lawyer and just coming out of, out of law school. And, and what he advised me was, make sure you focus on your skill sets and experience. If you think you want to become an agent, become a corporate lawyer, learn how to negotiate contracts, learn how to do deals, learn a certain way of thinking. And then you can try and become a sports agent after that. And of course, as, as often happens, one road leads to another. And I never tried to circle back to become a sports agent as, as my career evolved in different ways. But what I always did focus on was skill sets and experience. And so if someone wants to go into sports management, there's different paths. There's just not, as, as illustrated by me, there's not just one path. Um, if someone's interested in sales, they could be working for a consumer company. Never lose sight of sports, work on networking. But if you look, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, uh, Ford, Lexus, all, all these companies, have big sports marketing programs. So it, if one doesn't get a job with a team, one can try and work with one of the big corporations and get into their sports marketing or just get into their marketing department and then try and make it over to sports marketing. So it's important to think broadly, think of the skill sets and, and think of networking and try to identify potential paths even if one doesn't get a job in sports initially that eventually could lead to sports. And, and in doing that, one never knows where it's gonna lead. I went from thinking I wanted to be a sports agent to you know, living and working in Hong Kong, living and working in Tokyo, and, and doing all these different things uh, that I never expected, never dreamed of, um, but it was really all just because I, I was trying to think broadly. Fantastic. So this has been a great conversation. I want to thank you again, Rory, for joining us My here pleasure. on Case in Point, and we look forward to having you join us for the next episode. Thanks so much.